Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar focused on disaster planning and crisis leadership in healthcare. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a very esteemed panel of experts today. Today we're joined by Dr. Nancy Albert, who is the Associate Chief Nursing Officer of Nursing Research and Innovation at the Cleveland Clinic Health System. Dr. Sharon Pappas, who is the Chief Nurse Executive for Emory Healthcare in Atlanta. Dr. Tim Porter O'Grady, who is currently a senior partner at the Tim Porter O'Grady Associate based in Tucson. He's also a clinical professor at the Emory University School of Nursing. And finally, Dr. Kathy Malik. She's been a registered nurse for over 50 years. She also serves as the Associate Director for Education and Evidence-Based Regulation on the Arizona State Board of Nursing. And she's currently a clinical professor at the Ohio State University College of Nursing. We're very pleased to have each of these presenters with us today. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Kathy. Kathy, please Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, we are certainly excited to introduce our sixth edition of Quantum Leadership. Um, this is a labor of love for Tim and I over the years. Um, this edition is the beginning of our handoff to the authors um, Nancy Albert and Sharon Pappas. Um, we think it's important to keep the work of quantum leadership going and as Tim and I work um, trying to retire, which we have I've not been too successful at, but we're working on it. Um, for this webinar, webinar we um, are not only introducing the latest intro edition of quantum leadership, we are diving into one of our chapters and the importance of high performing teams using the um, dynamic cybernetic team model. Um, it's an advanced model that um, incorporates crisis management for disasters. We thought that would be really appropriate as we are living our uh, pandemic right now. Uh, next slide, please. So the team is really, um, as you all know, the centerpiece of all of our work. It's important that um, team members be involved in the change process from the very first identification of the need for change to the final implementation of the processes of change. I mean, whether it is business as usual or the management of a crisis. And learning um, to better integrate crisis management into our routine work is a higher level um, of team performance that we've seen from what we've seen in the past. And it's really essential for us to um, deal with our disasters from a strategic organizational perspective. And so when I look at um, our work, um, we have the pleasure of looking at the dynamic cy cybernetic team model, which we published um, in Quantum Leadership several uh, editions ago. And what we want to do is, you know, we have to ask ourselves sometimes, uh, are we ever finished with changing? And and so many times people say, I just need a break from change. But but the reality of it is that change is constant. And it's really about accommodating um, our changes and recognizing that change is the norm, that um, stability and the ritual and routine and processes themselves are so many times non-normative. And our contemporary and adaptive organizations recognize this reality of change and then incorporate it into their operating framework um, so that we can be successful. Next slide. So as we move um, really from traditional disaster planning um, to crisis management, um, we we think sometimes, you know, I, I look at um, how we we have separated out our fire escape group. We have that, we put the, the forms up or the pictures up and, and then we learn how to sequester in, re, in location for tornadoes and, and work like that um, and try to get those done. But our challenge to um, looking at, um, there's the disasters that we have, there's much more to it than the driver of, um, in the driver of crises and we look at broad-based immediate social, political, and economic shifts that create their own levels of crises with shortened times uh, for ad addressing these and intensifying the degree of risk to immediate um, 
incremental and sustainable processes that we get into. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about our pandemic of the COVID and how um, how do we get into that and how do we have some sense of a, a trustable, reliable framework that can help us with that. And, and we want to really get into a, having a discipline of crisis management and the ability to respond appropriately in any situation which is out of our norm. And so the studied, cautious, informed, and disciplined format for incorporating crisis management into our normative ac aspects of operating health systems is really what we're talking about with this um, cybernetic model. Uh, next slide, please. So we look at all of our disasters, um, look at um, where they come from, nature, social, political, and, and personal. These are all too common for us. And they seem so many times like an interruption in our work. And our goal is really to shift this work into our normative approaches to complex organizations. So let's take a look at, you know, we look at um, the noise and the hard work of change. And it really is about managing um, noise and different perspectives. Um, next slide, please. Um, in, in a different way than we have before. We look at, you know, this is a much larger context um, than we've often given um, attention to. And the dynamics of internal and external vagaries and variability really impact our lives um, as individuals and as organizations. And so the influence of these random factors is what we try to understand better. And then also understand this condition that we call noise and have a different or better level of personal and organizational attention to it. And not to see it as an interference, but really to say this is part of our world and it has just multiple different activities, um, interactions and work. And so the ability of an organization to accommodate these uncontrolled factors and making adjustments to them is um, really what um, quantum leaders want to adopt and get our levels of flexibility and fluidity built into the organization's um, work processes so that it, ins it ensures the organization's survivability. So next slide. Let's look at what did COVID do to each of us? And so what happened in COVID and what made change difficult for us? Um, what happened to you personally and emotionally um, at the center of this um, COVID uh, pandemic? And, and what particular elements created problems? Um, what happened to people? What were their attitudes and, you know, the sequestering in place and those things really um, dramatically impacted all of us in different ways. And then how well were we prepared um, to manage this and to figure out how to change and, and to really live with it? And so in a lot of ways, I find myself asking, who has the crystal ball? Who has that ability to know what's going to happen and, and how do I do that? And so the answer really is no one has a crystal ball, but we have collective capacity that we can manage this. And so next slide, please. And so looking at a crisis, the, um, the potential for crisis is consistently present regardless of how stable we think we are in the first in this particular stage. And so their crisis is embedded in the juncture between contemporary and normative organizational activities and occur at the critical moment when the external and internal forces converge to force a change in the organization's circumstances. And we saw that so dramatically in our COVID. I mean, when we had the critical mass of infections and things going on, there was something dramatic that happened at that particular point in time. And so, next slide, please. I have often asked myself, what keeps you up at night? What keeps you from making sure your organization is running smoothly? And then how do you keep that 
um, effectiveness and sustainability working. And so it really, it calls us to work to become much better at strategic crisis management. And so uh, next slide, please. So in, in strategic crisis management, what we want to do is read signals um, such as health reform legislation, executive waivers, and see what's going on out there. We want to be able to address critical variants. And, and so what that re really requires us to do is on routine uh, meetings, routine agendas, we always have to have a place on there that says, what are the signals that things are not as they seem or are going differently? What are you sensing is going on that's different in your environment? No matter which role that you uh, reside in in your organization, you really want to take a look at how can I more regularly discuss potential crises so that then the management and strategic crisis management becomes a part of basic operations. And so it's that complex integration and convergence of the present and the potential future. And so this is really a cybernetic process in which any action in a system um, generates a change in the larger environments and cycles back to trigger another change of whatever dynamic mechanism is built and must make it possible. And so I think we lay this foundation and I, um, I ask, I like to turn it over now to my colleague Tim and um, to really dive even deeper into the dynamic um, cybernetic team model. So Tim, let me turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I really appreciate that foundation because one of the things that's really interesting about crisis is that it really is uh, a change of pace uh, in response to something external that whether planned or unplanned for occurs in a critical moment. So uh, in complexity, the whole notions of traditional planning and organizing and uh, systematically addressing the future or a future state uh, generally doesn't operate as uh, linearly or as consistently as one might think in laying out the best laid plans of of uh, human beings under any set of circumstances. And it's because of that that we get a little concerned and uncertain and unnerved and, and unhinged essentially systemically, personally, organizationally in the presence of a crisis. However, crisis has a flow. It has a set of elements. It has a critical set of interfaces that are important to our understanding of it. That's why we call this a dynamic cybernetic team model, because the issue is that it's going to involve the human community, which addresses the team and the, all of the, the uh, activities and relationships and interfaces that need to occur for that human community to work and operate positively. That it is uh, continuous and unending, so therefore it's dynamic. Yet the internal mechanisms that we respond to depend on some systemic, clear, elements that are in place that can be accessed or drawn upon or utilized in any given set of circumstances um, uh, within a crisis. And that it is a model insofar as it can be replicated. It can be uh, utilized in a number of different set of circumstances. But the key term that we want to really uh, leave with you, even with, uh, with my discussion, is that leadership in these sets of circumstances is the ability to recognize what occurs externally and internally at the intersections or interfaces of the forces affecting organizations and the people that make them up. So the whole notion of intersection and interface and the life that goes on there and what is necessary to sustain that life is the centerpiece, if you will, of the complexity uh, systems understanding or the complexity leadership comprehension of the management and uh, handling of crisis. Next slide, please. And so a part of, of what we wanna be able to, get, uh, to grapple with and to get our hands around is to understand the action of these interfaces in a meaningful and, and uh, 
hopefully, a positive and productive way. We need to understand that there is a constant dynamic at the boundary between internal and external forces. The internal forces generate out of the life of people as they've gathered together to fulfill some purpose or to do some work. External forces are driven by the environmental conditions and circumstances in the vortex and flow of continuous and dynamic change that is a fundamental part of the, of the action of the universe, if you will. And there's an interface between the external forces, which are continually pushing against individual organizations, moving us along a trajectory that moves us ahead in our, in our social and human experience. And what lies ahead is really the representation of the convergence of all that we have done, either positive or negative, that stimulates our action as we move. How we've handled of uh, decisions, how we've handled uh, external forces, how we've handled the environment, how we've handled uh, social circumstances and, and all of the conditions within which we live that influence our movement as we go. Now, at the core of our human systems, of our organizations, inside of them, we do have a purpose and a value, a meaning, a mission, a direction, uh, a strategic imperative, you will, that gives us a value and it gives us a, 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 a point of reference for our part in the trajectory of the human community and uh, in line with the role that we play um, in a way that represents the choices that we've made in this organization to be and do what it is we've chosen to do. The team performance in that set of circumstances is what we've gathered together and agreed is our function and activity and our human dynamic or action that helps um, operate within the context of the uh, strategy that we've set along the trajectory of our organization within the context of the environment in which we find ourselves. If you'll notice, each of those four elements are defined by what goes on at the interface between them. And it's a change in that balance, in that interface that creates the uh, elements and conditions and circumstances of higher intensity, shorter term, in other words, crisis. Next slide, please. So a part of what we're looking at in terms of crisis is the immediate and dramatic change that occurs as a result of this radical shift, immediate shift between the external forces, which are environmental and technological and social and environmental, all operating in the winds around our organizational system. And then the internal dynamics that are in place in order to make sure that our, our ability to thrive, the fulfillment of our mission and our purposes and our goals, the activities and functions inside of the organization that facilitate that, the life of the teams, the integration of individuals with each other to build a community of work moving in a direction are, are all affected by some noise or some dissonance that occurs, some imbalance that occurs in that network that is dramatic and immediate. Now, the important thing for the leader is to recognize that this is a normative set of circumstances that continually operate within the long-term human dynamic of our lived experience. That this occurs at a very personal level, an individual level, it occurs at a family level, it occurs at a community level, organizational level, social level, international level. That imbalance occurs continuously and consistently and will always be with us. So the issue isn't whether the plan is a great plan, the issue is whether the dynamics that we understand can be managed in a way that we operate, we operate with an understanding of what tension, what shift, what activity goes on at those points of intersection between the various components that are essentially meeting there and the relationship of where other influencing factors that also meet to create the influence for change or the dynamic for shift or the crisis itself. And what have we done to be aware, to affirm our understanding 
and to be able to recognize, to verbalize, to intentionally respond to what is happening at those various points of in, inter, uh, section or interface in a way that can manage them meaningfully and in a way that can move them uh, effectively. So if you look at it in this slide, if you look at the model, it's essentially a, a representation of that dynamic. If you'll look at the way the model is, is, uh, is drawn, there is a, an, uh, an, uh, an interface between each of the processes and the major elements that are uh, driving those processes, as well as the major intersections which help define the, 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 the complex whole, if you will, between them. And that through all of the uh, continuous dynamic vortex of activities that are going on between them, there's a level of understanding the leader has of what the content is in each of those arenas. The content in terms of the dynamic, which is the relationship between the external and the internal, the macro and the micro. The interface context between process dynamics or process factors that are essential for us to factually and actually and operationally respond. And then the um, impact factors, the outcomes, the, the change, the adjustment, the, the, the small tests of change as they aggregate to major evidence of success or lack of success, the ability to adapt, the ability to adjust, the, uh, the, the skill sets associated with, with building small databases and sources of evidence, and then taking those sources of evidence and evaluating and analyzing their impact, their value, the difference they've made, the positive uh, nature of the outcomes or the negative nature. In crisis, both are valuable because both tell you something. Both inform you about where you are. Both inform you about the potential for shift and change that will occur. So it becomes really critical for us to be able to, to comprehend and understand that. Next slide, please. So if we, if we recognize the, all of the uh, vortex of effort that is going on in all of those arenas, then we begin to recognize that the major components have a life at their own place in the system, their own uh, 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 demonstration of their contribution to the system's response to a dramatic change. Um, clearly at the point of service, at the place where the organization or system lives, there's the team-based synthesis, the gathering together around a major uh, imbalance in the in the external internal environment and its impact on the work and activities and relationships that are done at that point of service understanding and being able to articulate and being able to internalize the impact of these changes in a meaningful way the capacity of leadership to look at the relationship between the external demands of the crisis the external demands of immediate change and the internal infrastructure and processes and human dynamics inside to determine how well they resonate and how well they act in consonance with each other. Or what are the elements of the noise that are creating the, the discordant um, uh, impact on the organization? And what will it take for us to understand about that in scanning these conditions and circumstances to be able to respond to the crisis in kind in a timely fashion. And then ultimately to be able to shift systems to respond critically to the immediate shift in balance and to bring to, uh, to fore and to, uh, to bring the weight of the knowledge and the skills and the resources that are available in a, in a systematic way to make this happen. So that there's a, a clear uh, uh, sense of organization in the crisis that is driven systematically. So if we take COVID, for example, and we look at all of the issues associated with that and try to look at it uh, free of the political implications, although it's not possible in a crisis to eliminate political implications because it's one of the conditions and circumstances that influences how uh, well we respond to a crisis and provides perhaps the, uh, the uh, first short, uh, shortest term evidence of whether we're responding well. But generally, if you've got a, a systemic crisis, you recognize the systemic crisis from the system, from the system's level, from the level of where the system is managed as a whole. 
And that because of that, there is a protocol, if you will, a format, a framework, a model like the one we're describing here that is, that is uh, uh, defined and thought through with a clear understanding of the, of the conjunctions and intersections and relationships and functions and interface of responses that are necessary to work in concert in order to be responsive to the crisis. And that it is uniform, it is universal, it is unilateral. For example, the mask issue, uh, universal precautions are universal because the virus doesn't op operate differently because you're in Arizona or you're in New York. The virus doesn't act differently. The crisis isn't different in terms of the actor, the virus. The virus is consistent. And what we, what we, we use to respond to its conditions and circumstances, driven by the science and what we know of how it acts and behaves, is the driver for the universal responses, the universal activities, the non-negotiables, if you will. Now, what politics does is make the non-negotiables negotiable. And what happens is, while the non-negotiables are universal, we compromise the universality and create a secondary critical incident that actually takes our attention away from the driving critical factors that come essentially associated with the crisis itself. And then we begin to watch essentially our response break down as we pay more and more attention to the um, elements of the breakdown, the subsequent subordinating um, elements of the breakdown than the initial drivers, which are still critical, which are still creating the circumstances because we have abandoned the universal rule set that is essential for us to act in a uniform way at the places where uniform response is critical to success. Now, clearly, uniform response isn't critical to success everywhere in the system, but it is at the universal level of the system, cultural, social, uh, human, environmental, and local factors all have an impact on the mechanisms that are used for implementing the universal. But it doesn't change the universal. And so at the universal level or the systems level, clarity has to be there with regard to what they are, what they demand, and what response will have to be uniform and universal. Once that's clear, then we can begin to look at the circumstances that reflect the next level of interface which may be between the service system and the internal external environment. It may be between the supply chain and the number of uh, interfaces the supply chain has in order to make sure that appropriate materials and supplies and resources are available. All of that becomes a part of the next level of change. And that is moderated by resources, by uh, uh, cultural, social, legal, and uh, uh, availability as well as design issues around in, in, in a particular example, uh, the uh, supply chain realities. All of that gets defined clearly so that people can depend on an equitable addressing the problems uh, related to those issues at that point in the environment in a way that is fair and um, makes best use of decisions and resources in that framework. That would be called the adaptive effectiveness, the way to adapt the organizational systems. Because one of the things that, that uh, characterizes a crisis is this conflict in the area of, of, uh, of the demand of the crisis and the resources available to address it in a positive or holistic way. There are never ever in any crisis a sufficient uh, a, a lay of resources to address it in an, a, uh, an absolutely uh, perfect way um, since uh, resource management is not a universal imperative. It is driven by a whole bunch of other influences and intersections that make it success or clarify what its success will be or will not be. As you can see in this dialogue, this is chapter seven of our book, 
quantum leadership that goes into this in great detail. As you can see, the impact on the leader is considerable because a good leader isn't somebody who makes good decisions. It's somebody who makes sure that good decisions are made. Made by whom? Made by the people who own them and made in the places that are necessary in order for other good decisions to be exercised successfully elsewhere in the system. So a good leader isn't so much interested in her or himself making really good and great decisions, but making sure that good and great decisions are made in the places where those decisions belong by the people who are charged there with what needs to occur there in order for the system to succeed or to operate or to adapt effectively. So the, the leader has to be able to understand these forces, the intersections, the interfaces, the decision frames that relate to what needs to happen there, the role he or she plays in facilitating those relationships and interactive dynamics, and then the adaptive effectiveness that results and evaluating the level of that effectiveness in order to either adjust or change action that is uh, moderately or marginally successful or not successful to um, newer small tests of change that would generate a different measure of success depending on the circumstances one finds themselves. So the leader must be able to conceptualize this con uh, complexity notion of leadership and then recognize that complexity is what you manage at these interfaces, at the consonance of forces, at the, uh, at the conjunctions, if you will, of decisions and organizational actions in a systematic and organized way. Next slide, please. So if we think about all of these elements and just quickly summarize, you can see on the slide that what we've really uh, tried to do, uh, at least I tried to do it in 15 or 20 minutes or less, is talk about something that really should involve at least 13, uh, 13 weeks of conversation, is to be able to, to see that there, are, there is relatedness in a crisis uh, that is systematic and logical and and uh, uh, not precise because of the, the confluence of, uh, of change built inside of the crisis, but organized and systematic in a way that's meaningful. That at the environmental level, we scan for things like the external and internal relationship, the emergence that is occurring there that is creating a, a disequilibrium or a change in the balance the action of the forces that are operating either to act on it or are impacted by the change that's occurring. And then the recognition that some change is occurring, as Kathy mentioned, that some significant change is occurring and it's that change that is the crisis and therefore embedded in it, just as in all change, regardless of the pace of that change, is destructive elements that are in some way changing the world in a way that will never exist again, in a critical way that is through its destruction, opening the door to an altered view, an altered condition, an altered set of circumstances that will forever adjust the way in which we live um, uh, following or subsequent to the uh, vortex and dynamics of the crisis actions. But inside of that, signals are provided Signals are provided that give you some idea of, of what those changes are, the global trends, the potentials, the critical conditions that uh, will influence what we're doing. For example, think about education. We will not think about education at any level in our social systems in the same way in which we thought about education prior to it. There are some who would suggest that these kinds of major, major universal shifts are actually the universe uh, attempt um, uh, to, uh, to shift our mental model um, in the face of our effort to force ourselves not to shift it. Um, now that's obviously operating at the philosophical level and we could spend some time there, but a part of the mechanics of that is that the, the critical incident actually forces us to shift our capacities, our mental models, our mindsets, our skill sets, in, in ways that will better respond and therefore respond differently going forward than we were able to before the critical event. And, and then those elements serve as triggers, if you will, um, that uh, 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 name or define what it is we will end up dealing with as we try to make these adjustments 
and make these changes in a meaningful way in all of the places in which they have an impact. Uh, example triggers that, that we have on this slide are uh, environmental triggers so in terms of the environment itself, market losses, resource losses, um, a whole range of poor decisions that uh, are simply not sustainable and have had a deleterious effect on, on people and society and institutions and all of the impact that has on the political, legal, social, cultural, and personal and psychodynamic shifts. All of that occurs as a result of that shift. Next slide, please. So as we, as we look at, at the effect of the leadership and the work that's done, we need to recognize that inside of a cybernetic system, evaluation is constantly going on and is constantly a part of what we unfold. And so uh, defining really, really effective evaluation mechanisms that are objective and are uh, definitive are critical to our ability to adapt, our ability to thrive, and to uh, essentially be able to, to create positive uh, conditions that raise our human experience rather than so critically affect our human experience that it actually um, moves down Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and I, I mention that uh, here just to know that evaluation is essentially built into every stage so that we can adjust over the short term. Next slide, please. So hi, this is Nancy here now, and I am going to just share with everybody a little bit about what to expect in our sixth edition of Quantum Leadership. Um, you can see seven bullets here, and the seven bullets are themes from each chapter. So I'm just gonna go very quickly so we can give uh, Sharon Pappas a time to talk a little bit about the seven chapters on, in the second half of the book. Um, in the first one, you could see I put communicative vision and to understand the complexity of planning for the future. And we know that the most important task of healthcare leaders is really to communicate their vision for the future and to bring energy and commitment to reforming the healthcare system. We need to use inspiring stories and show our vision um, by our behavior. And we need to remember that we need to make sure all stakeholders are fully engaged um, so that we could really understand how we can move forward. Leaders must be able to respond appropriately to the demand for change, and, and you've just heard a lot about that with crisis leadership. We need to anticipate the blocks in the way of substantive change, and we really need to remember that it's not good enough to simply be great at form and function. We really need to be able to balance a complex, a complex range of skills and systems and resources to develop worker capabilities and to really grow our organizations. So quantum science has an affinity for multidirectional complexity and uncertainty. And so the name of our book really implies all of the many forces going on. And leaders must really incorporate the vagueness of complexity and chaos into the process of anticipating and planning for the future. So in chapter one, we discuss reading the signposts to really better understand you know, that change is even imminent, and to assess both the external environment, not just the internal environment. And when we make change, we need to ask what difference has that change made or done? What, what's really going on? And ultimately, most of the work of leadership is managing these intersections and connections between people and processes. When we think about understanding actual and potential reality, we need to remember that actual reality although that's the state most of us live and we focus on the present and it includes our experiences and what is happening now, that potential reality is just as real and current and it considers inclusion of upcoming events, seeing the work we do as a journey and focusing on really good outcomes, not simply the work, but the outcomes and the focus of individuals but not as individuals thinking about them in terms of team performance. So ultimately, good leaders have predictive and adaptive capacity. In chapter two, we spend time discussing the 10 complexity principles for leaders. So we won't talk about them here, but again, this will be really helpful for any leader to really understand. When we talk about innovation leadership, leaders must have a philosophy that they support, influence, facilitate, cultivate, and really develop shared objectives using novel concepts, 
algorithms, products, services, and technologies, despite potential risks. Innovation leaders must span boundaries. We must take risks by experimenting with untested processes, techniques, systems, and products. Innovation leaders must have a vision and leverage opportunities, and we must be adaptive. Innovation leaders are coordinators of information flow, and they are facilitators. And ultimately, innovation leaders must balance the need for value and profit and the creation of new and improved approaches to healthcare. So in chapter three, we discuss innovation leadership and how we advance innovation. In chapter four, we talk about a culture of innovation further. And chapter four of quantum leadership really dives deeper into this culture. We need to have an infrastructure that allows ownership and freedom and investment on the part of the innovators. The theme is discussed at the point of service among first time leaders, and as an organizational network, including the board of trustees, our senior leaders, and we remind readers that it is if the leader is not willing, neither is the staff. And so everybody must be on board in this together. When we talk about key drivers for change, we need to think about how we measure practices and values, and leaders must consider key drivers for change in this way. Healthcare systems are complex and they're interconnected. And as you just heard with crisis leadership, they're not always predictable. So in chapter five, we really discuss the issues that we know drive change, such as cost, cost shifting, demand for care by US citizens, but without accountability, easily quantifiable metrics that are observable and empirical, but may not really explain all the factors associated with value and not um, using evidence. So in chapter five, we also discuss the seven strategies behind a new healthcare valuation model. And so that'll help people that are really into leadership, especially our new leaders, really understand how they need to think about what's going on in their organizations and where the value is for all of the key stakeholders. Managing conflict is a great chapter because it's something that never goes away, and I'm sure all of you on the phone call can relate to that. Leaders must acquire basic conflict management skills. The environment must include open communication, and leaders must devote resources to recognizing sources of conflict so that disputes are really handled in the right way at the right time. The goal should never be to devote resources to avoiding conflict. So in chapter six, we provide the steps of managing conflict, conflict productively. We discuss the sources of conflict, for example, team-based conflict, identity-based conflict, isolating interest conflict, relationship-based conflicts, value-based conflicts, structure-driven conflicts, and even data-based conflicts. And then we go on to discuss the 10 steps of resolving conflict. We already discussed crisis leadership, so we won't talk about chapter seven, but I hope that gives you a little bit of an overview of the first seven chapters, and we'll let Sharon come on and talk about the next seven. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, everyone. This is Sharon Pappas. Um, I'd like to pick up where Nancy left off, who gave us a nice uh, elaborate list of things that leaders must do. And one of the things we wanted to accomplish in the remaining chapters of this great text is to talk about how leaders must be. And as keepers of the culture and all of the years, um, probably close to three decades that I have spent in nurse executive leadership roles, I've learned over and over again that the leader must intentionally partner with others to ensure that things happen. A leader has the accountability and also um, is, is somewhat paralyzed unless they can create strong team relationships, realizing that safety, uh, both for their uh, teams, um, or as Tim referred to them as the human community, I love that, um, and also the safety of patients are some of the things that are so incredibly important in healthcare and among nurses. And we realize that that's another very key element. I often say that relationships are at the center of patient safety. 
Also, one of the things that you'll find in chapter 11 are some new aspects around clinician well-being. Uh, before that chapter talked a lot about cultures and about toxicity, uh, but we wanted to expand that further and be able to bring in some of the current thinking around the importance of the well-being of our clinicians that being the discipline of medicine, of nursing, of pharmacy, and others. Um, because we recognize the very uh, strong importance of the clinician uh, and their own well-being in order to be able to achieve the outcomes that are needed. We also want, talked a lot about the concept of accountability and the importance of courage. All of these are elements of how a leader must be. And then um, the willing leader was another aspect of our, um, of our inclusion in these last half of the chapters, where we're talking about the leader's willingness to advance personally and also advance the team. And then finally, we, we conclude with a lot of information about the importance of the concept of hope. And so starting with safety with some new elements in um, about human, um, about the, um, the whole human accountability around high reliability organizations. Um, that has been added to chapter nine and we will uh, be able to expand that further as that is all rooted very soundly in the core uh, relationships that exist within the team. But this concept of hope, being able to improve lives and provide hope is an incredibly important element of leadership. And if a leader doesn't uh, understand how they must be in the context of hope, it's, it's difficult to transfer that hope um, to your team and your organization. So all of these, um, these last part of the, of the book are about the leader is the keeper of the culture and how that leader must be in order to accomplish many of the elements that are essential to leadership that Nancy just reviewed in the first half of the chapter. So the sixth edition is packed full of a lot of exciting things and a lot of modern concepts around things that have emerged since the uh, fifth edition of the text. And we're very proud to be able to bring this into the nursing community as well as the broader healthcare community as concepts that we say often in my current place of employment, when nursing goes well, the rest will follow. So with that, I'll turn it back over. I believe we have some time designed for questions uh, from the group. Well, thank you, Sharon. If you're interested in learning more about the newly published Quantum Leadership 6th edition, you may do so and also request a review copy by visiting go.jblearning.com slash quantum 6e. Or if you have some additional questions and you're interested in reaching out to any of the presenters today, they have been kind enough to provide us with their contact information. I do want to extend a very big thank you to each of our presenters, Dr. Nancy Albert, Dr. Kathy Malik, Dr. Sharon Pappas, and Dr. Tim Porter-O'Grady. This concludes today's presentation, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today.